Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In this video, I want to speak from an Age of Empires 2 YouTuber's perspective about the differences between Age 2 and Age 3. The goal isn't to disparage it and argue that Age 2 is the one everybody should play. I certainly plan to get Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition when it comes out in a couple of weeks, but more just to talk about the reasons I think Age 2 became so much more popular than its sequel. Whether it's by physical sales after release, players on Steam, activity on forums, really any metric you use, Age 2 seems to have a significantly larger player base. Though, of course, we'll have to see how the Definitive Edition impacts that. In an interview with one of the Age of Empires 3 developers, Bruce Shelley, in 2011, he had this to say. With Age of Empires 3, we tried all of these new ideas. I think it was a huge mistake. We wanted to create something that was 30% the same, 30% borrowed, and 30% innovative. It was like being a child changing all of the dials on a television and then trying to get the picture back. It just wasn't an age game anymore. That's an unusually candid critique by a developer of their own game. With the upcoming release, I've been trying to get to know the game a bit more, and my opinion has definitely improved while going back to it now. I'll start on a positive note by talking about what I think Age 3 did well, and why I think some features are underappreciated. First of all, I think the home city concept is a good one. At first, it's off-putting, and for some people, this is a negative of the game, but after putting time into leveling up a couple of cities and unlocking more cards, I really think it adds a cool dimension. It's fun strategizing before the game even starts, and trying to anticipate how the game's gonna go and in what order you'll need to send things. You have to balance long-term versus short-term, having a balance across different ages, and it lets you customize your civilization to a degree that isn't possible in any other age game. In a way, it's almost like picking additional civ bonuses. In another universe or timeline where I'm an age 3 YouTuber instead of age 2, you can bet that guy's having a great time making videos on all the hidden effects of the cards and the optimal shipments. There's a lot of depth to it. The fact that you have to level up the city from scratch when you play online is a bit of a problem though, and means you need to farm XP and grind until you can actually unlock good cards. And from what we know, it sounds like Definitive Edition is going to address this. The home city feels like a situation where you have a really interesting idea, but something about how it's implemented turns people away before they really have a chance to explore it. Another change in AoE 3 I like is their infinite food generating farms and gold generating plantations with a slow collection rate. The fact you have a non-optimal way to continue getting food and gold income prevents games where everyone just runs out of resources. It also means at a certain point you can just focus on military. Over its lifespan, Age 2 has been moving closer and closer to this idea, with first the farm reseed button added, and now the automatic farm reseed. At the end of the day, nobody plays these games solely for the eco-management, and once you're up to around 200 population, military management is where I think the player's attention should be. I also think the batch unit creation is a nice change, and same thing with the Minutemen. There's a few ways to get units out quickly, which is important given how easily buildings can be taken down and how early raids can happen. So now let's talk about the things, again for me primarily as an H2 player, that I think are the weaknesses H3 wasn't able to overcome. The first is the time period, which isn't to say medieval era games are automatically cooler than colonial era ones, but more that it leads to some counterintuitive counters. One might even say counterintuitives. There's a lot to memorize about how some quite similar looking units will interact, and knowledge from other games outside of the franchise won't translate as easily as they do to Age of Empires 2. In fairness, AV3 is quite good about being transparent with attack multipliers if you take the time to read them, and AV2 of course has its share of hidden bonuses and resistance that's unexpected for new players. But here's a little demonstration if you haven't played a lot of AV3 and don't know what I mean. Here we have a field gun, culverin, and horse gun. All of these are available to the British, and two are anti-infantry and one is anti-artillery. I'm gonna be honest, it's not obvious to me at a glance which is the anti-artillery one. It turns out the outside ones do triple damage to infantry and double damage to buildings, while the middle one does four times the damage to artillery, ten times to ships, and half to cavalry and light infantry. Those are some very steep modifiers that you don't want to fight against. Compare that to siege units in Age of Empires 2. I think it's fairly intuitive that the ram and bombard cannon will be good against buildings, and the scorpion bolts firing through units and the mangonel dealing damage to an area immediately imply situations you could use them in, even without the game explicitly telling you in a description. Let's play another round. Which of these two AoE3 units counters the other? They both have guns, and the one on the left looks like he's dressed a little fancier. Maybe he shops at Burberry. The stats even look pretty similar, but it turns out the guy on the left is heavy infantry and the guy on the right is light infantry. If you haven't played H3, it kind of feels like they should do about the same damage to each other. But what's this? Skirmishers do double damage against heavy infantry. What? With equal numbers, the fight isn't even close. 
Of course, you'll learn the counters eventually and they'll start to feel natural, but when you're just picking up H3, this isn't intuitive, and I think is a byproduct of a more difficult era to base this sort of rock, paper, scissors type of game in. Just to cherry pick an example for the AoE 3 players to try, which of these two incredibly common ranged units in H2 is good against the other? I think it makes sense the unit with the shield is going to do better, and indeed that's what we get, with the skirmisher countering archers and crossbows. It's not to say H2 units never have hidden attack bonuses that catch people off guard. What about the Genoese crossbowman tells you it has an attack bonus against cavalry, while the regular crossbow doesn't? Obviously, you're going to need the description to tell you that. With medieval units though, armor and shields can often indicate how strong a unit is going to be, and from start to finish you have the classic archer, pike, cavalry counters that everyone knows if you played any sort of medieval game before. Another thing that I think turns H2 players, and maybe RTS players in general off of H3, is that battles feel awkward and like your army alternates between sprinting and fighting in quicksand. They'll switch from moving quickly to barely moving at all if they're getting into formation or if they're attacked by melee infantry due to something that's called the snare effect. In H2, micro is really its own minigame, with split formations pulling in and out of range, and repositioning units when they get into a matchup against a counter unit. I get there's tricks you can use in H3 to speed units up, and I'm sure at a high level all sorts of micro is going on. But it seems odd that units are perfectly happy to sprint around the map until they're actually fleeing from a battle, or even if just one unit in the group is out of position, and then the whole battalion moves at a quarter speed. It can be frustrating to have units feel clunky or unresponsive right in the critical moments. You also end up being doubly punished by taking a bad fight when slow movement forces extra losses during a retreat, and it creates a snowball effect after one poor engagement. The snowball effect of battles is just one contributor to another big difference though, which is the pace in H3 is much faster. You typically advance to the second age in about half the time with a much more simplified first age, train a large army much faster in batches, and ultimately don't really have time to get invested in your town before the fighting starts. I understand wanting a faster pace, and certainly there is an extended Dark Age in H2 that is going to turn some people off, but I think that emphasis on early action comes with a downside. I can't find the source now and hope I'm not misremembering it, but I recall a developer for Age 1 or 2 in an interview said something to the effect that they very intentionally wanted to make the game feel like you've built something and you have some ownership over it. When your town is attacked, you want to defend it because you made it, you're invested in having it prosper and that this is by design. That sort of emotional investment takes time, and in H2 you spend the first 10 minutes or more with just you and your city, placing buildings and planning where you'll expand into. In fact, most people's first hour with H2 is just playing it as a city builder. In H3, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but it feels like you can be 10 minutes into the game and have a town center, three houses, one military building, maybe a market, and that's it. Half your villagers are across the map following a buffalo herd, and most of your attention is on the two or three skirmishes that have already happened. The lack of drop-off points in houses giving double the population space means you often have less than half the buildings you would in Age 2, and takes away from that empire planning and personal investment in your town. One solution to that, of course, is to play Treaty, where players can't attack for a period of time and can focus on their economy a bit more. Next, I want to touch on some of the more philosophical changes that came down to basically personal preference and why I think the Age 2 approach was more popular. The first is the choice to have radically different civilizations. H3 elected for fewer units, but with very little overlap between civs. Bonuses are also much more extreme, like Britain Manor's giving a new villager every time you build one. An extra villager in H2 is a very significant bonus, and this is basically a free villager for every house you make. For other examples, Japanese have shrines they can build for passive resource generation, and even more extreme in my mind is Dutch villagers cost gold instead of food. Since every civilization plays so differently and has a mostly unique set of cards they unlock through playing that civilization, you're pushed into specializing in one particular civ at a time. In H2 you have a bit of that, but they ultimately share the same tech tree with a slightly different combination of units in the late game. Barring a couple of exceptions, every civilization's Dark Age is almost identical, and technically every civilization can do men-at-arms, towers, or archers, and 31 out of 35 can do a scout and night rush. What you learn are strategies, and then which to apply to different civilizations, rather than entirely new game mechanics for each civ. Mastering one also translates to others with just a few minor adjustments to your economy and army composition, and after a few games besides unique units you rarely encounter a unit you haven't seen before, because you probably have access to the same unit yourself. Personally, I've always liked the H2 model for making it easier to go random civ, but very successful games have gone with both models. Scouting for treasures is also a totally different direction and has some divided opinions. 
I get the idea of wanting to make sure maps are balanced and consistent, but still add an element of luck with treasure. In my mind, it's a preference thing, and I think ties in with the simplified early economy, which might otherwise leave you with not a lot to do. Again, it's time and attention players are spending exploring and not connecting with their growing town. There are other differences, of course, like the campaigns, map size, user interface, and artificial limits on building and villager numbers, but none of these ever seem like major issues to me. Smaller, rounder maps are played on H2 just fine in both the map pool and in tournaments, so it's obviously not a deal breaker. I've been asked quite a few times what I think of H3, and the truth is it's grown on me recently the more I've played it. I'd never put more than 5 or 10 hours into the game for the reasons I've talked about, but having put in another 15 to 20 recently, I'm starting to appreciate some of the things that I initially didn't like. I don't think the game suffers from a lack of content or is necessarily too simplified, but was hurt more by a lack of accessibility. I think H2 has similar depth, but is more friendly to learn in comparison, and as a result has built the larger following. But those are just my thoughts on H3 heading into Definitive Edition, which I haven't played but am looking forward to. Shout out to Connor, Jean-Paul, Drew, Brian, Gabe, Heliosan, Matthew, Noah, Paul, and Samantha, as well as everyone else on Patreon for supporting what I do. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.